everybody and uh, welcome to the BCS Enterprise Architecture Specialist Group uh, webinar. Uh, topic for this evening is the Town uh, Planner EA, um, where we're going to go through uh, what that, who that Town Planner EA is, but also look at um, town planning and how it applies to enterprise architecture, some of its kind of history around it, um, and actually probably learning from other, other professions as well around what, what that brings to our, our profession. Um, in terms of the format this evening, um, I'm going to be introducing myself, I'm Ian West, um, and I'll talk you through the first part of it. We'll then move on and we're going to have a talk from Lorne, uh, Lorne Mitchell, who will uh, introduce himself as we move forward. And then a section with Galal, Galal Adin, um, who uh, will be finishing off the, the speakers part uh, of the thing. Uh, we will then move into a Q&A session. Um, and so if any thoughts occur to you as we go through the presentation, please add them into the Q&A window. Um, and we'll pick those up towards the end and we'll have a little bit of a Q&A where uh, any questions which come up, we will be answering those uh, and sharing them. Um, also, the chat window is enabled. So if you want to have a conversation with your colleagues as we're moving forward or other people on this webinar, uh, please pop that in there. Um, so that's just in terms of the format. Um, I suppose we just need to make you aware that this is being recorded um, and uh, post event, we'll be posting this uh, up onto social media. Um, if there's anything, um, shouldn't really be, but if there is anything that perhaps you've posted um, or a question um, that, that you're in, may not necessarily, we're trying to avoid using names um, and use that way. And from a social point of view, we use the, the uh, at BAS, the BCS EASG uh, for our tag. Um, and you can do hashtag town planner EA from a social media point of view. Um, that's written for an introduction point of view. Um, and as I mentioned, the speakers this evening is myself, um, Lorne Mitchell and Galau uh, Galau Bean. Um, Lorne, did you want to mention anything before we get going? No, I think that's great, Ian. I think that's great. I think it's just worth saying that we're going to be talking a broad range of um, ideas this evening. Uh, so if you've turned up to look at specific sort of e enterprise architecture tools, that's not what this session is about. So just sort of preparing people. Because the last time we had a load of expectations, I think, of people turning up looking for, you know, specific EA kind of stuff. It's going to relate to EA, certainly, but I think we'll be looking at a, a broad range of ideas, which will hopefully stimulate you all. Thanks, Lauren. And Galau, anything you wish to add before we get going? No, I'm fine. Thanks, Ian. Let's crack on. Okay, thank you. So, as mentioned, um, myself, Ian West, I'm, I'm a practicing, practicing enterprise architect, um, worked at a wide range of organisations in a wide range of different formats. Um, so this evening, I wanted to talk about the Town Planner EA um, and what that is. And actually, this is part of a series of uh, talks that we've been doing from BCS point of view. Um, previously, we've talked about the Corner Shop EA, uh, somebody who um, serves the kind of small business local community um, and what that means uh, from an enterprise architect. And typically, I kind of break EA down into kind of planning, design and governance as kind of three activities. And that corner shop EA is very much a, a generalist EA covering all of those areas and, and serving a particular type of client. Um, we also covered um, Ivory Tower EA, which uh, again is uh, an enterprise architect who is much more focused on strategic planning, working with people like from the C-suite, uh, senior leaders of business about well, actually where could the organization be going uh, and very much focused on strategic planning there and very less on the kind of design and governance piece of it and as I said this evening we're going to be talking about the town planner EA um, somebody who um, is much more focused on what the roadmap of the business is going to be over the next few years and where it's going to go um, and in a moment, I'll go into a little bit more detail around what that means from a persona point of view. Um, potentially, we're looking at a future event around the, the artisan EA, somebody who's a bit more focused on um, working with uh, design teams, development teams, and a bit more kind of from that perspective. Um, that's something we look about in the future. If you are interested in those other two talks, Corner Shop EA 
and the Ivory Tower EA. They're both available on YouTube on the BCS uh, Specialist Member Group channel. So the Town Planner EA, who is this, this enterprise architect? And and best way of describing it is kind of if I take on the persona of that, that EA uh, and what they do. So, you know, as per kind of other town planning activities, um, and I'll read it off of here actually, because I think it really sums it up, but that town planner EA is somebody who helps organizes, organizations decide on the best way to use their technology. And their main aim is actually more to achieve sustainability by balancing the needs of people, process and technology. So they are very much about, well, where does the organization want to go? How can it develop and make uh, best use of its resources in various ways, but also paying attention to the changing landscape over that time. And I think sustainability is a great way of looking at it for as an EA, because actually I'm helping the organization sustain itself and, and exist into the future. And so my motivation as that kind of town planner EA is in a number of ways. First off is I want to really understand the enterprise. I want to describe it. Um, and so, because that's important, because if you can't describe where you are today, how are you supposed to kind of design for the future? And by kind of describing the enterprise, it helps me support decision-making uh, and decision-makers. So, you know, that could be senior managers, that could be um, project teams, et cetera. But being able to come along and if they've, they've got a choice, helping them make that decision through the ability to previously kind of map and describe the enterprise, which leads into that kind of multi-year planning. And so, yeah, I'm motivated there to actually help people into the future and guide future development as well. So not just create that, that kind of multi-year plan um, for sustainability, but actually execute against it as well. And the benefits to the enterprise of that is first off, you get a nice baseline of where you are today. Um, and I think um, sometimes it's, it, it, that's great because then business leaders know where they stand. Um, and often, particularly in very large enterprises, that's quite hard to describe because no one person is able in one place but actually, as that, that uh, town planner EA, I've got this nice broad view across the organization. And therefore, um, I've got a, a fairly unique position in terms of being able to describe it. The other benefit of organizations is it kind of helps making informed decisions. So not just relying on um, instinct or kind of a narrow view of what's going on, but actually on a much broader thing. So. Um, I can also say if one, one decision uh, department's making a decision, I can help with the other one and, and kind of link the two together. Which brings that kind of the other benefit is those sustainability plans. So making sure that the, the plans in place actually do support maintaining the organisation. Um, and then on top of that, laying those controls on to guide that change as well. Uh, and that could be development teams, that could be project teams, um, or portfolio teams as well, at, at that kind of level. And so as that, as say, as that town planner EA, um, I like knowing what the organisation is today, and where it's wanting to get to over time. Um, I'm less actually concerned with designing uh, in terms of getting down into solutions and development and that kind of thing, there are other people in the organization who will do that work and carry that forward. I just want to make sure that they're doing it in the right way. And so if I look at the clients to, to what I'm trying to do, it's really, you know, strategy teams, they'll be, you know, looking for that kind of broad view, that, that description of the organization to help with strategy. Um, portfolio management teams as well, because actually they're looking at often looking at multi-year programs um, and collections of projects. And I can kind of help um, say whether they're on the right track or how that aligns to, to sustain the organization. And that finally makes that kind of business decision making, um, uh, the, the decision makers themselves, giving them comfort that they're making the right things. Um, and if I was looking at being a setting up an EA practice of this kind, the sort of services that, that I would offer would be enterprise catalogs. Um, and that is, you know, 
looking across the organization and finding out what's there, what it's being used for. Uh, and so you may come into kind of capability models in that space or technology capabilities as well. Um, I'd also be offering kind of an analysis and planning services, uh, as I say, around that kind of sustainability. So less about kind of innovation and, and um, exciting new stuff all the time, but um, some of it could be, you know, how do I maintain my I don't know, mainframe system or how's my data going to evolve over the next few years and how I make sure that I'm making the best use of it. And finally, again, that kind of assurance piece. So if a series of, say, a program's running, being there to say, yes, you're on the right track, you're following the right path as laid out. And they're the sort of services that I would offer as that kind of town planner EA. Um, and so kind of in summary as that town planner EA, I'm very much there. I'm going to be cataloging stuff, exploring the enterprise, documenting it as I go, um, very much kind of building maps of what the organisation looks like. And then using those maps to help people plan um, in a way that creates a roadmap for the next few years. Where would they like to go um, and how will the organisation evolve? And finally, providing that assurance so that as things do move forward and as change happens, um, it's done in a sensible way, which as shown here with those kind of Jenga blocks, it's not going to topple over, it's going to stay standing uh, as we move forward. And so they're the, they're the pieces that, that I would look for. Um, and I think for me, I just wanted to describe that as the time planner EA, what that person might look like and how they are. I'm now going to hand across to Lorne, who's actually going to take us off in a slightly left field view, um, but actually looking at the past um, to learn things from the past, which actually help us in terms of being enterprise architects. So Lorne, over to yourself. Great, thanks Ian. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a bit about um, a, a hero of mine, uh, Sir Patrick Geddes, uh, who was a Scot. Um, he lived um, uh, over, uh, over 100 years ago. Uh, in, in the chat, actually, it'd be interesting to know, has anyone heard of, of Sir Patrick Geddes? If you, if you have, just put yes. Um, and uh, I can see the chat. Is anyone? <laughs> No, I can't even get the chat. There we are. Yes, someone, Nigel, great. Okay, so one or two people. So the rest of you probably, uh, he's new to you. Right, so let me see if this works next. Uh, and I'm gonna get him up and start. Uh, this is the guy here. When we were doing the rehearsal, it's quite funny. He's got his center parting, so it's quite, quite distinctive. Uh, he was born 1854 and died in 1932. Um, and he, he's the grandfather of town planning. When Ian said he wanted to run this session, I thought, ah, let's, let's see if we can get a bit of Patrick Geddes in. I've got hundreds of slides, so I'm going to rush through them and, uh, and, and give you a whistle-stop tour of Patrick Geddes' life. And through it, um, hopefully some of the panellists will throw in any kind of thoughts they have in terms of how they think it's relevant to EA. So he was, he was born in, in Ballater in, in West Aberdeenshire in Scotland, and he moved uh, to Perth in 1857 and then went to Edinburgh University. Um, and, and finally moved south to, uh, to, to, to sort of get out of Scotland. And he had a, he had a very sort of successful uh, career, academic career, and a career as a sort of uh, global town planner, really. And as I say, he, he was the main sort of um, uh, guy to, to sort of start thinking about time planning and how it worked. Um, one of his famous sort of uh, contributions were his, he, he called them thinking machines. I mean, he was in Paris um, a bit later and he had, um, he, he was a great sort of mapper, <laughs> which I think as EAs we all are, we're always trying to map stuff together and see how things fit, how things relate. This was one of his, uh, maps, if you like, uh, as to how all the uh, various sciences um, going up from mathematics and logic up to sociology all mapped together. He was a very keen sociologist in terms of understanding how humans interacted with not just their environment, but, but, but other aspects of, of biology and uh, stuff like that. Um, and he, these, these thinking machines were kind of three-dimensional um, sort of 
uh, ways to show how economics, geography and anthropology all fitted together um, and how everything is really interrelated. And that was his key idea. This is one of them. This is a simple one. He was very much a person of place. Um, the idea that, that, you know, place is central to how you work. And often I think in EA, we have this idea that you can come in from another company, another business, another industry and lock yourself in and and, and without understanding place, sort of map everything around the outside. I think he was very keen on the idea that the place uh, is, is central to uh, good sort of planning. Um, this is uh, the map of, of a slightly more complicated thing. You'll see place, uh, folk work and place up the top left, which were two of the three of his sort of things he was famous for. Um, place relating to work, relating to people, folk. Um, and again, that's very typical in, a, in an organization, but also other things like culture and law and, and uh, ideas. Uh, and this got more and more complex um, to, to, to his sort of ideas. And, and he ended up with maps like this, which um, really, you know, become <laughs> in typical sort of EA terms, probably meant a lot to him at the time, but become quite difficult to explain to people. Um, so that was one thing he was... Yeah. Famous I was, for. I was yeah. going to say, Lorne, these remind me so much of the frameworks that we see of for enterprise architecture. Um, yeah. You know, we're always drawing and creating these kind of relationships between people and, and oh, you mentioned earlier, you mentioned people, what was it economics, place, and that. And we, at the same time, we talk about people, process, and technology. And it, yes. it, it just reminds me of. The same thing it's almost like the same kind of it is the same kind of concepts yes absolutely you'll see in this more complicated diary on top left you, you know you've got acts deeds facts and insight i think it is um so yeah and the thing i like about him is he brought you know things like emotion and sense and sensed experience you know this is stuff that's come quite late in it in terms of customer experience and stuff like that he rarely looked at it in, in a sort of an holistic way. Um, and some of these things on the top right, the, the deed stuff seems to go back to Latin and things like that. I don't know, but I haven't got my head. And he's also got religion and mysticism um, as, as well. So he, he was trying to sort of create this framework as to how everything went. But the, that, that earlier one starts to sort of, he gets more complicated with it. Um, but as you say, we probably have our own language now. And I think the trick with EA is to have a map that people can understand and not, and not give them something like this where they, where they spend half an hour trying to work out what the heck's going on. So that was his. He was a great naturalist and, and, and he, uh, he actually um, spent time laying out the Scottish Zoological Park in, Park in Dundee. Uh, he was the professor of biology there. Um, and, and he had this real sense of the natural world. Um, uh, he, he, there's a quadrangle still named after him. Uh, and this is one of his quotes, city improvers like gardeners from whom they develop fall into two broadly contrasted schools, which are really just as in gardening itself, the formal and the naturalistic. And he was clearly a naturalistic guy, but you, I think you get that uh, you know, in, in EA as well that the people who are very strict and rigid and formal and the people who are more organic and allow things to evolve and allow things to take place in a more natural way, um, as is probably the difference between French gardening and English gardening, you know, in the traditional sense of French gardening being very formalistic and, and, and English gardening uh, and perhaps Scottish gardening too, being, uh, being a, bit less, uh, a, bit, a bit less rigid and a bit more sort of um, organic. Any, any thoughts on any of that, guys? No, okay. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, you, yeah, it's kind of different styles, isn't it? They're both, they're both planning a garden, in that yeah. example, you know, they're both planning a garden, but they're going about it in different ways. And again, if you relate that to EA, it's like you kind of almost got to understand where you are and what's expected um, about how you're yeah, going to... You know, are you in an organisation which does grow naturally, which is kind of like your British one, or are you in one which is, wants to be a bit more, you know, yeah. 
structured and yeah, it's, it, it's in it's interesting the uh, the influence that you know large systems landscapes have had like SAP that come in and say right this is how it's done, yeah, and uh, and and the more organic uh, type of EA, which is certainly what I am, I think <laughs> it gets sort of knocked over by another great tranche of of, of some big uh, system coming in. So so yeah, so that that's that's um that's that. Uh, yeah, and then the, one of his famous sort of legacies is a thing called the Outlook Tower in, in Edinburgh. Um, unfortunately, I can't see the Q&A to, to sort of work out whether anyone's been there. It's the end of the Golden March, just before the castle. And it looks rather extraordinary. You'll see this sort of funny thing on top, uh, which is called a camera obscura, which was a great um, uh, Ill um, Ill Ill Victorian, uh, idea it captures light and then projects it onto a large sort of concave bowl in the middle of that brown thing on top and it was the early form of a camera really um so uh that's um in edinburgh you can go and see it and and he had this um sort of way of taking people up via a staircase to the top to begin with camera obscura taking him into this this view of edinburgh which i'll take you through in a minute and then you, you, you walk down the stairs through Edinburgh, then Scotland, then language, then Europe, and then the world. And the idea of these levels of abstraction in the building, um, they don't have that now. It's, it's more of a sort of family exhibition now, uh, which is great fun if, you, if you've got a spare uh, half day in Edinburgh to go around. Um, and he had these three S's, uh, which he, he promoted um, in it, sympathy, synthesis and uh, synergy, which again, I think are, are really nice ways to look at EA, actually. I mean, the, the three S's of one of the things he was very sort of famous for, and, and, and it was all over the Outlook Tower. Um, but sympathy for people and the environment, you know, we're, we're getting more and more like that now. Businesses have to be in sympathy with the environment as well as the people within it. You know, and 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 uh, a lot of the corporate social responsibility stuff is absolutely key to sort of linking that in synthesis of all the factors relating. In other words, not being siloed, not being actually uh, too analytical, and then synergy. You know, trying to get everybody involved, not having sort of uh, too much of a top-down hierarchy. So again, I think quite a nice way to look at it. Uh, the camera obscura. If you actually go into it, you can see Edinburgh. This is the castle. This is Edinburgh to the south, and you'll see in the near ground uh, a lot of the old town, which was re completely re-architected on, on Geddes's principles. Uh, they in the east down the Royal Mile out to the Scottish Parliament and Holyrood Palace, and then to the north, which is Edinburgh New Town, which uh, from this view doesn't look great, but that was where a lot of the, the new houses were laid out and where they drained the lake for the station. Um, but uh, the, the key when Geddes was there was the old town. It was, it was just slums. And Geddes became famous. You'll see a sort of picture here. And he actually moved into the slums. He moved his whole family in in order to, you know, be in it. Uh, it's sort of, it's a bit like that uh, Japanese thing of go look see. You know, he actually went and, and, and got his children and, and his whole family in there so he could, he could make it better. And he also saw Edinburgh in the context and, and, and other Scottish cities, in terms of regions as well, that the city was dependent on the region and the region was dependent on the city. And this whole idea of city regions um, was, was really his idea. And again, within context of EA, you know, often you'll, you'll maybe have um, the, the, the company, but, but, but the, uh, or the enterprise, the enterprise exists within an industry often, uh, and, and it's important to look at EA in the context of, of the industry. I've done quite a lot of work around the circular economy, and that's absolutely key around looking at it from an industry point of view. So again, I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts on, on, on that, but I think some of the parallels you can draw from town planning and EA are very useful. Okay, so uh, he then went to Scotland, the next layer down. Um, and uh, his, his son, Arthur Geddes, uh, the one that survived the uh, First World War, drew this map of Scotland. And I always think it's rather, takes a bit of time to sort of tune into. 
Um, but this is from the Outer Hebrides. And I think you can probably see looking north back to Europe, you know, how the Scots might look uh, as, as, as the English plain, you know, without any of the hills um, and being a, a sort of a, an eagle, if you like, soaring above Scotland. And, and the maps we make uh, can often completely change the way people look at things. Uh, and I think that's often the way when you think about what maps you're going to show in EA, you know, what really, what point are you trying to get over? And, and how could you perhaps reconfigure the map to make it more meaningful or make it more um, sort of customer centric? Yeah, so that it's perhaps their view of the enterprise rather than the enterprise's view of the customer. Because we get terribly bogged down in our own processes and systems internally, and we often don't look out, uh, outside in, uh, back into the organization. Yeah, and that's a bit of a close up view. Lauren, it's, um, you know, as a town planner as well, I can, I can see the whole, I'm not focused in on one part of the country, am I? Even though, you know, you're looking at it from a Scottish point of view. I'm still you're still showing the whole country and how it's all connected it's not yeah um which is all part of that kind of broader planning view is it's not one part it's that kind of interconnectedness of everything yeah exactly exactly um yeah and he he he, he had this sort of geosophy this philosophy around geography yeah um, which again is, is interesting from the EA point of view. You know, we often um, philosophize about the maps that we create, yeah? Um, and yet, you know, they're often interlinked. You can't create maps of organizations and enterprises without understanding some of the culture and perhaps some of the history of, of where, why and where the organizations come from. I often find what I call the industrial archeology, span but going back in history and talking to people who are perhaps in the business 20, 30 years ago, if it's not so young, you know, five, 10 years ago, and find out why were certain decisions made to take the business forward? Why were certain systems, maps created or applications and, and infrastructure put in? Um, and, and actually doing a bit of digging, you can often get to some uh, new and more meaningful ways to take the thing forward. Interestingly enough, he, he broke out of geography at the next layer down, it became language. Um, and I, I think with the internet now, we've become hyper-connected with language and, and now you can type into Google anything. This is actually one of the um, uh, exhibits in the, in, in the current Outlook Tower. It's a sort of tunnel you go down and it's spinning around and creates you completely wacky. You come out the other end feeling completely giddy, even though you've just walked down a ramp. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's great fun, but you know, it's, it's a bit like the internet now. You get so much input, so many things coming at you. It, it, it kind of makes you a bit giddy. Um, and also there's a sort of a hall of mirrors uh, where, where you come up against mirrors and you don't know where to go next, you know? So part of the EA is, 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 is really to sort of give people the maps to, to, to get people sort of orientated and, and give them a sense of direction. Um, so yeah, the, the language of EA is interesting. I wrote these notes earlier, you know, what is it? You know, what, what, what's going on and what could be possible, you know, from an EA point of view across multiple layers of abstraction, depending on what you want to tune into. Another of Geddes's quotes was think local, act. No, think global, act local. I've got that wrong, sorry. <laughs> Which I think HSBC have, um, but you know, thinking, wide and then acting in a local way um, and everything connected and obviously everybody's got their own favorite maps and diagrams you never want to criticize somebody else's diagram because there's always something in it uh, to, to you know to, to get out and so long as it's not so complicated that nobody can understand it you know it's worth digging into a bit so the language of EA is interesting as well as the language obviously of, of, of the way we speak and talk and, and in English um, then to Europe, he, he went from Edinburgh to Dublin and did the slums there um, early on um, and yeah, wrote um, a, a, a book called Cities in Evolution and then set off around the world. He lived in India for quite a long time um, and he helped Indian cities become habitable. He also did some work in Israel for Tel Aviv and Tel Aviv's laid out now in the way that Geddes planned it. Um, he was married to um, 
someone called Amelia, and they spent a lot of their life together. Um, she seemed to be the sort of calming force <laughs> in the family. Uh, I love this quote where, you know, Geddes was so hypercharged, he kind of electrocuted people with his, with his ideas, um, which uh, is interesting. And he had uh, three children, um, one of whom unfortunately was, was killed in the, in, the, in the First World War. And then his, in, in, in the April 2017, and then Anna, his wife, died in, in June. So 2017 was a pretty awful year for Geddes. Um, and the other child, uh, the other son, um, Arthur, the youngest there, he went on to archive all of Geddes's work. He died, um, oh gosh, only about 20 years ago. Um, so uh, his stuff is, is still well archived and he died in the end in, 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 in 1932 in France. Um, so his legacy is amazing. I mean, one of the other great expressions he had is by leaves we live. I don't know what the analogy is here, but you know, the idea that every season leaves fall to the ground and create the soil and the earth and the nutrients for the trees to, 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 um, to, to sort of come up the next year and all the plants and, and everything. Um, and he was very much in touch with nature, which I think we've kind of lost in a lot of the corporate stuff we do. Yeah. Um, so um, whereas the world's mainly vast leaf colony growing on, a, uh, on and forming a leafy soil, not merely a mineral mass, not just rocks. And we live not by the jingling of our coins, but by the fullness of our harvests. And as the planet heats up and, you know, we get more stress with, you know, supply chains and food and where people live. I think these things are going to become more and more important. Um, he was really the head, way ahead in terms of sustainability. And he mapped out in this organic way, you see those sort of maps of the town and the country and the country and the town that look like leaves themselves. And this also, uh, this is the University of Dundee, the idea that was a in the hinterland around a city, a miner, a woodman, a hunter, a shepherd, a peasant, uh, all contributing to the life of the city. And of course, with globalization, these links have become much less obvious and a lot more tenuous in many ways. Um, this is the Geddes collection in, in Edinburgh and, and a, an exhibition about the by leaves we live. So finally, yeah, his three S's, sympathy, synthesis and synergy. Um, he left a great legacy in terms of the work he did. And I think there are many, many parallels worth drawing in terms of how we practice as EAs. And uh, he remains one of my heroes. That's it, Ian. Thank you. Thanks, Lorne. That, that was really good, actually. And I think um, for me, it's that kind of connection of EA with... Um, actually stuff from the past as well. So, you know, whilst, whilst described as sort of town planner, somebody who's there to kind of map out the organisation how it grows, that's not an exclusive kind of thing that enterprise architects do. And, and clearly, you know, Sir Patrick Geddes was doing it a long time ago. So I think there's a there's great opportunity for us as enterprise architects. And if you're in that kind of town planning space to look to the past and look to other professions and kind of draw from that um, and actually um, improve our profession. Um, and I think, you know, rather than trying to think that we may have to reinvent something or do something differently. Now, obviously, we're, we're working with different materials to, to um, what Pat Geddes was working with, but, you know, you can see the parallels quite a lot. So next uh, speaker is Galau and, and Galau's... Um, Already, are you going to uh, grab hold, Galeo? Yeah, is that okay? Um, just sharing what? from my own stuff. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Ian. Thank you, Lund, for the uh, very interesting uh, presentations. Um, I'm, I'm actually a professor of uh, information systems uh, at Cairo University, uh, uh, and I got interested in architecture uh, sometimes after I was uh, submitting my uh, PhD for, for examination. I actually got to study architecture for about uh, five years, both at the undergraduate and the postgraduate level. I guess one of the uh, strongest Im influences on me, and uh, this also affected my thinking about systems, um, I, I have to say that I was mainly interested in methodologies for designing uh, software and designing information systems. And the 
sort of characteristics that various methodologies would uh, generate in the system that we are designing. So I came across uh, a book by a chap called uh, Stuart Brand uh, while I was uh, working on my- Sorry, uh, Galali, the, uh, Galal, we're getting your, um, your, your sort of screen with lots of things on it. Is there a possible to just to have the central slide up? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, let me, uh, let me try and... Uh... Yeah, it's the presenter's view, but let me try something else. Can we can we go like that? Is that? Yeah, better? that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is usually the safest way of going about that. Okay. Uh, so the uh, the build the the book was entitled uh, "How Buildings Learn." You know, um, uh, what happened after they built, and uh, actually it was accompanied by a, a series in the BCS, not the BCS. I'm sorry, in the BBC, uh, six six part series which you can actually uh, view on YouTube. So the author is Stuart Brand, and, and this, is, uh, this is the argument that he was putting forward, uh, starting from uh, these Victorian buildings in San Francisco, which sort of lasted uh, over uh, 200 years, uh, continuing to satisfy uh, the needs and the desires of the various inhabitants, whatever they did. So if they lived there, uh, as in uh, using them as houses to live in, it was fine if they turned them into offices or clinics or uh, uh, places of work for commercial uh, commercial uh, exploitation or whatever. It accommodated uh, they accommodated a, a very wide variety of uses that did not actually occur to the designers of those buildings. Uh, so he puts uh, this is actually the cover of the book on the right here: How Buildings Learn. Uh, th this kind of uh, idea that uh, these buildings uh, managed to evolve and adapt and survive for a very long period of time because they were built from uh, various uh, layers that allowed this uh, extension and this uh, continuous uh, adaptation of the uses. He actually said there's a number of layers that could slip past each other gracefully. Uh, so if you wanted to make a change in, in the innermost layer in here, which sort of changes very quickly, like the uh, uh, stuff that you put in a house, for example, the decorations, the uh, light fixtures and so on, you could do that without having to play with the services layer, for example. Uh, and similarly, you could play with the services layer and change, for example, where you put a bathroom or a, a, a wash basin without having to change the, the heavier uh, and the more fundamental and difficult to change structure of the building. So I've got the, this, this sort of hierarchy of layers running from the most stable and the least uh, changeable to the most flexible and most volatile right in the center here. So you go from site to structure, to skin, the services, the space plan, the stuff. And the thinner the line is on this diagram and the more arrows you have on it, it meant that its life cycle went much, much faster at a higher velocity uh, and, and in terms of, of changing things. But the key thing here is that you did not have to mess about with the other layer necessarily. Of course, we have something like that in, uh, in software systems when we say, so say, okay, maybe you want to model the database first, um, uh, and then you can define a number of functions on top of that. But let me uh, show you something else. Now, if, you, if you're a nomad living in a tent, uh, this kind of uh, layering and this sequence of uh, stability of layers from the most stable to the least stable or the most changeable actually is dramatically changed if you think about it. So uh, in traditional uh, urban uh, uh, milieu, you have the site as the uh, most stable and the least changeable part, but actually for a nomad, the site is a very changeable thing. Perhaps the most stable part for a nomad is the um, actually the skin of the tent, which they would made out of um, uh, clothing, with, uh, just, just materials or uh, 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 skin or animal hairs, etc. This was the this is the precious thing that they needed to preserve for the longest period of time, and it would last them uh, longer, perhaps, than anything else. Even the structure is not as stable as the skin of this of this particular uh, uh, structure. So the idea is the, the 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 what we think or what we find as a logical uh, sequence of uh, of stabilities, if you like, or volatilities, can be uh, dramatically transversed or transposed when you look at a different context. Now, um, uh, uh, what this means is that if you start modeling whatever is the most stable part for a particular organization, if you're thinking about enterprise architecture, you come up with something that could uh, allow 
a wide range of functions that you perhaps did not consider or did not think about when you started the design. And actually we have something very similar in, in terms of the uh, uh, software design uh, philosophies and methods, uh, a method by the name of JSD. I don't know if anyone uh, here heard of it, probably uh, some of you have, uh, which stands for Jackson System Development. Uh, he actually started with, with something very interesting. He says, do not model the functions of the system. Do not model or do not start by analyzing what the system should be doing in terms of functions, because these functions are changeable. And they could actually uh, evolve with the time uh, as the business changes, as new requirements emerge. And we've all seen with the uh, COVID-19 crisis, for example, what happened to uh, businesses where the fundamental uh, operating model of the, of the business had to be quite dramatically changed in response to uh, the situation where people could not actually go to shops anymore. So in terms of online sales and stuff like that. So what Jackson advocated is that you start by modeling uh, the fundamental subject matter of the system, the very stable thing in the system that would not change or very unlikely to change as long as the system uh, of this business or this enterprise is about a particular thing, about a particular entity or concept. Uh, if you start with that core, then you can uh, plug in uh, uh, functions and requirements later on. So you had a, a range of implied functions and they're implied by the fact that you've actually modeled this fundamental subject matter of the system. And some people actually referred to this uh, paradigm as sort of the original object-oriented uh, object oriented uh, design method. So where, where, does, uh, where does that uh, uh, take us? Uh, this is actually a new slide in, sorry, I, had, I sort of added that uh, from, again, from uh, my hero in terms of urban morphology, uh, Bill Hillier. Uh, Oh, we just lost Galal. I'm not sure what happened. He's now, you're on mute, Galal. Yeah, no, sorry, uh, my, my connection suddenly uh, backed out. Okay. Um, when, you, when you think of an artifact or, or some, some kind of um, a technical thing that you're building, what does it actually do? What is the fundamental theory of that thing? It, is it... Um, and implement, like you use it to uh, do something to leverage your powers with respect to a particular task, for example, um, uh, um, a fork and a knife to eat with, uh, or a spanner to um, uh, undo a bolt or something. So it's, it's an implement as in it's, it's enabling you, it's giving you leverage on something. Or is it a type of artifact that actually uh, stores potential? Uh, henceforth, it's called a facility type artifact. It's like a dam that stores energy, like a battery that stores electrical uh, power or a motor car. Uh, it actually has, has the potential of giving you a range of uses that you have not uh, thought about or uh, enumerated or listed at the beginning of you designing this thing. So I'd like to think of an enterprise architecture as not just uh, an artifact that enables us to do something or to think about how the enterprise would do something that achieve certain goals or uh, operate an operating uh, model, but rather more like a facility which enables a, a wide range of uses and, 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 and potentials and scenarios that the designer has not uh, thought about. So Bill Hillier's work on, on urban morphology was to actually model uh, the, the structure of towns uh, and cities and settlements in general, as well as, as, as houses and traditional, traditional buildings, actually. And he used a particular uh, 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 set of modeling primitives, which I, I don't want to go into uh, too much, but the idea is that you can predict uh, uh, and you can enable a very wide range of potential uses if you embed the, uh, uh, the various spatial uh, uh, areas in the city in a particular way. So this, 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 this example of his analysis, uh, on, this, on the city of London, uh, this thing in the middle here, the red thing, is actually Oxford Street with ex extension towards the east and, and the west. Uh, now, Oxford Street became like the heart of shopping in London uh, because it gave navigational advantage to anyone who's on Oxford Street. So if you're on Oxford Street, you'd find it the most easy street to navigate from to any other part of London. Therefore, it comes out in the analysis as, as red. I mean, the analysis has a particular method to go about it. You don't just look at the map at the side. But uh, the idea is this is the most connected and the most enabling in terms of its connectivity to the rest of, of the street grid. Um, so this 
the idea that, that Oxford Street is embedded in this way gave rise to a very wide range of potential uses that uh, you would not have, have uh, been able to predict right at the beginning if you were doing a formal design rather than an organic uh, growth of this particular system. Now, I did something similar on the uh, city of Cairo, where I originally come from. This was for my a massive thesis on, 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 on this urban morphology uh, business. And again, I found very uh, similar uh, ideas where you have the, the reddest street, the most red are the most integrated or the most integrating of the urban grid that would actually, where you have uh, most of the commercial uses and, and most of the businesses that want to be there and most expensive in terms of property prices and stuff like that. Uh, now, the other correlations that, that uh, Bill Hillier found but here's the type of analysis is that you see these areas that are uh, colored in, in, in blues. So the more you go towards blue, these are the most segregated parts on the, uh, on the grid. Now, uh, when, when uh, they did correlations between uh, the embeddedness of the streets in the, in the grids and things like crime rates, antisocial behavior, you find that the most antisocial behaviors and street crime and stuff like that would be concentrated or highly correlated to the least integrated parts of the town. So the idea that you can actually model a system to, uh, to predict or to allow certain types of emergent phenomena uh, to emerge later on is for me very, very interesting. And the question is, how do we design enterprise architectures so that the generated properties are things like uh, resilience, like flexibility, ability to adapt to other, other uses? Uh, this is just a slide that shows you uh, a very similar effect inside the building. So it's not just the, the city uh, or, the, or the town planning grid. It's, it's actually inside the building. This is actually the, uh, the, uh, the Tate uh, Britain that they actually analyze using the same technique. And again, the reddest or the most integrated parts of the, uh, of the museum building is where you'd find the greatest number of footfall and, and greatest number of people uh, walking across and moving from one place to another. This is an observation over a long period of time. So actually at one, at, in one example, I, we actually stood and counted the number of people passing through various uh, parcels, uh, spatial parcels in these buildings. And again, here the idea of a generated uh, behavior. So the, the behavior is affected by the fundamental architectural design of this system. Uh, so for me, again, the idea is how do you design an enterprise architecture to give rise to the properties that you'd like to see later on in the system, even though the executives could not give you all the potential scenarios, all the potential uh, changes later on. And I think uh, this is another uh, uh, new um, slide, Ian, about where, where you put flexibility and where you put rigidity. Uh, so the idea that, yeah, maybe you can uh, do a formal design, but only where it counts, uh, only where you want things to be base or um, uh, inflexible or stable along with a certain period of times, like the site and the structure uh, layers of a building. So uh, in, in a summarized sword, you'll actually find that the base of the sword is actually very rigid, very hard, uh, but at the same time, you find that the tip of the sword is actually very flexible, and that is achieved by how quickly they, the, 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 uh, the artisan has cooled the, the steel from which the uh, sword is forged. So this, the, the, the tip here would be would be cooled at a much slower rate yeah, than, than the, the base part by putting you know, extra clay at the, at the bottom when, when it's cooled. And I'm oh, sorry, actually putting extra clay at the top. So he would slow down the cooling process at this part and this part of the source to so get flexibility where it counts. So you don't want necessarily flexibility everywhere because if you have flexibility everywhere, you don't have anything to work with. But the idea is to embed your rigidity or the stable part of the structure, maybe where you put more effort in, when you consult more people, where you're interested in resolving more conflicts, etc. I noticed there's a question here from one of the uh, participants about uh, resolving conflicts and stuff like that. So the idea is you need to embed or map the, um, uh, the architectural characteristics of the enterprise, which I actually refer to as architectonics and other, other work, which you can look up architectonics, which means the differential uh, embedding and the differential modeling uh, uh, of parts of the enterprise. So the rigid parts uh, should be the stable parts. So the stable parts should be more embedded, spend more time on it, spend more money on it, invest in equipment and stuff like that, but keep other parts that are likely to change or need to remain flexible uh, later on. Although you cannot obviously predict the future, but the idea is uh, you need to assess your designs against uh, a range of potential uh, futures, but I think the, the sort of this sort of fundamental modeling is much more useful. Uh, 
So the, the takeaway message for me is like, okay, the, uh, you could have layers within layers. So I know we have all, all the uh, TOGAF type models where you have the uh, infrastructure, you have the, uh, uh, the, the data, you have the uh, services, etc. But I think even within those layers, you have other types of layering. Uh, uh, methods that you need to look at to make the enterprise resilient in, in the face of future unpredictable uh, future changes. So uncertainty is not equally distributed. Yeah, of course we have to. We talk about uncertainty all the time and how we have to cope with them. But I, I my, my bet is that it's not equally distributed. So you need to do this uh, business of differentially embedding things. So if I'm if I'm, if I'm to come up with a methodology, because I'm interested in methodology more than anything else, really, is to sort of say, okay, if you do level one on architecting, your first layer of architecting is look at common wisdom and experience and state of the art and what people like the experienced people um, uh, at the face call, as it were, know and practice already. Level two would be to map the architectonics and the change behavior and, and the resilience behavior of the domain into the architectural layers of your enterprise and level three would be uh, tweaking and, and, and fine tuning to achieve things like maybe um, other other non-functional properties or qualities like maybe uh, securing things more um, making making uh, performance better etc uh, etc et i guess I'll, I'll leave you with those thoughts and um, hope we have a nice uh, discussion after that thank you very much okay uh thanks claire that's, that's really interesting, actually. And I say, from a, I say, coming back to kind of being that, that town planner EA, it's really interesting how you kind of shown those different layers where actually, if I'm planning the enterprise, where do I need that flexibility? Um, or, or where does the enterprise need that flexibility? And where do we need those kind of foundations that, that will allow that sustainability over time? A bit like, you know, um, those, those townhouses you showed at the start. <laughs> Imagine trying to design a, a and it, I think it'd be a bit crazy for an EA today to say, I'm going to, I'm going to design something which is going to be around in 200 years or a hundred years, but actually maybe that's something that we, we need to aspire to that, you know, if you were at an organization and you did the town planning, if you return to that organization in 10 years or 20 years, you can still find the, those foundations that you put in place. To, to happen uh, and actually I find that quite exciting because um, that's kind of shown that I've engineered, I've created that sustainability for the organization. That's Remember the millennium point. millennium bug Ian, yeah? The millennium bug, <laughs> we had systems that, that were there for 30 years and, and no one, uh, no programmers imagined that the systems would last that long. So they had the two, the two uh, digit uh, date, date fields. Yeah, well, I've, I've come across one recently where um, you know, systems have been around for like 20, 30 years. And during that time, inflation and, and the cost of living has increased. And it's now like, well, I'm not even sure I can and hold these numbers um, that of people's personal wealth in these systems, because at the time, I never imagined that people would have that level of wealth. Um, so yeah, there, there is a, a things like that, which I think we're always learning with computer systems about their, their limits, but what they're capable of. And um, maybe again, looking at that kind of outside of uh, the industry, you might pick up on stuff which is which has changed over time and pay attention to it. Um, so no, no, that was really interesting. So um, I think that that was what we had from a speaker point of view, but I think I've gone too far now and I've put closing thoughts. Oh no, I've put Q&A, final thoughts and closing comment. Slightly wrong there. Um, what, what I wanted to do now is, um, you know, we've got, got panelists here. I know um, Gabrielle's joined us and we've got Chris as well. Um, we're going to kind of do some Q&A if there are any questions there, of course. I, I'm assuming we've got, got some people who would lo love to ask us some questions and kind of our thoughts and experiences and that. Chris, can I hand over to you to kind of uh, prompt some discussion? Yeah, sure, Ian. So um, there's been a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A, um, given we've got, um, I suppose, quite a cosy audience here. Um, what I'm going to do, Pedro's asked a question around typical town, EAN, town planner EA contracting procedure. So if it's OK, Pedro, um, if you'd like to talk and elaborate on that slightly to open that up to the panel, I'm just going to allow you to talk on the Zoom call. Uh, 
I think Pedro's gone, I'm afraid. <laughs> Has he? I think yeah. we lost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we well, lost them. So, right. okay. Maybe, okay, is, maybe if we there. address the question. Yeah. So, so the question was, what is a typical town planner EA contracting procedure? I'm trying to understand whether that's a, a getting a contract or being having a contract, as it were. Um, I'm not sure I quite understand the question, Chris. I don't know. Can I can I have a go? Yeah, so go I, I think if I if I relate it to to sort of um, you know the local borough council or something in in the UK, you know. That the, the, there's a planning authority which is, is similar in many ways to, to EA, where there are certain building regulations and restrictions, and certainly where I am, the planning authority is very uh, weird, if you like. You can have a, a sort of building uh, like the one I live in that was was, was built in, in 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 the Victorian era. It's, it's listed, unfortunately, <laughs> because there are so many restrictions around it. I can I can barely do anything with it, and and there is an aspect I think to contracting if you if you want a sort of the contract you know I I'd like to contract a builder to change things but I can't because of all these rules that have been thrown in my place, and I think there's a very useful analogy with local authority town planning and the EA function and often the EA function takes on the role of which isn't in in your uh, sort of uh, quadrangle, uh, Ian. But as as a policeman, or as a as a as a sort of person who's 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 you know making sure certain guidelines or or rules are kept to, and and uh, so what, however you want to contract within your own uh, solution area can often be overridden by the uh, the, the quirky or, or sensible rules that are thrown down at you uh, from from the EA function. So that's how I read it. Yeah, you, you touched on something there, Lorne, about being the, becoming the policeman. Um, and when I think about how I suppose I was relating this here to town planners and how they plan out the future, often within that local council, you will have the town planning group who will plan where to go in the future. But you also have a building regulations group who would be the person setting the, the standards. And I think... Um, sometimes with EA practices, they try and do it all. They want to be the town planner, but they also want to be the building regulator. Um, and you kind of get bogged down in all this governance stuff, isn't it? People are coming to you with designs and you, you're expecting to rubber stamp it. Um, but actually it detracts you from the point of, well, actually I want to plan where we're going to go into the future. Um, but I think from, a, you know, so that, that's kind of thing. Um, I mean, if I was contracting... If I was looking at this from a as a, a person looking for work, let's say from a contract point of view, and I was looking to find be that EA town planner EA, I'd, I'd come back to the beginning where I'd want to be working more with kind of portfolio teams or strategic groups um, to look to find where my work is going to come from, and where you know make those contracts with those people um, from that space. Um, any comments from you, Galau? Um, well, um, um, I think I'm, I'm interested in, in, in looking at the um, next question, actually, about the architect yep. and um, and the builder relationship, or the programmer yeah. relationship. Yeah, very happy. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I see it. I see it as 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 not a conflict, as as necessary uh, coordination. You know exactly like an architect would would draw the general plan of the building or the town if you're talking about town planner and 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 the uh, programmers or the builders have to uh, talk to them uh, there needs to be a dialogue for example as an architect uh, you might get a builder saying oh you cannot possibly fit uh, a bathroom in that in that area because of blah 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 which theoretically on, on the diagram seems like a perfectly sensible thing to do so that you know, of, of a, co a continuous dialogue, a disciplined dialogue that is, needs, needs to be carried on. And part of the architect's job is, in fact, is to resolve these conflicts uh, with, with the building team or the implementers team, as well as the C-level executives as well. He, he's like the arbiter, really, between 
the, the business and the executives and, and the builders. In fact, I see a lot of similarities here between the enterprise architect's job and, and the system analyst. I mean, my, my first master's is actually in system analysis and design, and a lot of the stuff that we're discussing today is, is, is about resolving these conflicts and, and streamlining things and fitting things together from, uh, you know, from both points of view, technical uh, building stuff and the strategic business uh, goals and objectives uh, kind of thing, as well as the the humans who are, who are, who are being involved in that. So the idea of, of uh, people centered or people oriented, uh, UX oriented views as well is, is very relevant. Okay, and I, I think um, from my point of view, I would say, um, because see the question, yeah, you know, do you see the conflict between the EA and the program project builders? Um, if I was thinking perhaps more at a kind of design level, let me work at that level. Um, I, I actually encourage to say that if you've got a program, you need an enterprise architect to go along with it. Um, and I don't see them as conflicting. I actually see them as complementary. And, and actually a good program manager uh, and portfolio manager their focus is about, you know, are we doing the right thing? Are we getting the benefits from it? Are we spending the money in the right place? Those kind of questions. So the performance of, of the build where the, the architect is looking at, you know, am I, is, the, is this going to deliver the, the structure needed for the organization? Is this going to deliver on the performance that the organization needs and that kind of thing? So from that point of view, um, and so there's slightly different uh, perspectives on the same thing and actually I think a good a good EA and a good program manager working together can do fantastic pieces of work um, so I think there is a tendency for people to try and you know the program manager maybe try and do the solution and sometimes the EA will try and run run the the project as it were but actually in a good a good working relationship it's it's stronger um, than that, and actually, they should be complementary. Um, what about from yourself, Lorne? Yeah, well, I was I was reflecting on Paul's other question actually, because we were talking about silos earlier. So you can have the builder EA conflict, but the builder can be working for one of the organisational silos uh, as well, and that could create architectural disharmony. Uh, it's happened to me in the past where. Uh, IT chose a system and we were trying to get it um, enforced and one of the uh, operating divisions uh, went outside the box and, and, and created a completely different system with a whole load more software and the CFO was really fed up because, because the discipline wasn't there to, to have the original system being imposed across each of the divisions. And so I think it, it can also come down to politics, you know, within organizations and as Software as a service platforms have, 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 have grown out of all proportion. You know, the, the idea that, 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 that we're building anything anymore, you know, we're configuring things more than building now uh, for a lot of these systems. The real tensions, I think, come on the interfaces where perhaps these systems have, have, have got a load of data that's useful to other parts of the business. And it's a bit like Galal's um, uh, sort of blue zones on the outsides of the cities, you know, and they're all in their little sort of ghettos and, and you want to get access to the data but you can't because nobody's developed the systems interfaces and so you have two or three people actually you know on swivel chairs typing the same information into two or three different systems and I think the, you know these these ideas doesn't matter how well well organized or how great the EAs are you always find these tensions in the organizations that you work with uh, and, 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 and it does come down to politics and control at the end of the day and so your ability to negotiate and and, and make people see common sense many of the uh, as, as galau was saying basic systems uh, analysis techniques business analysis techniques we learned early on in the career are really helpful um, but uh, ultimately it comes down to compromise and negotiation um, which has nothing to do with the systems at all <laughs> it's to do with people <laughs> can i just jump in here for a sec I was thinking that that question kind of relates to um, what Galal was talking to about where you want to have flexibility, or I think of it as variety. Where do you want to have the variety? You kind of want to have a strong core of stuff that doesn't change that very often, but you want to have variety so that you can end up in a position where so long as everybody reports into, you know, central headquarters with the right financial data and the right 
everything else I need to run the business. Perhaps there's bits of flexibility at the external ends where you can say, well, you can run your bit of the business a bit differently. Like this division can have the same sort of, you know, uh, can, can choose to do things a little bit differently because they're doing a lot of other stuff that's consistent with the rest of the organisation. But they need you need to plan in this variability so that people don't feel like everything's doc, you know dictated from the central sort of head office that nobody ever sees, and and so they have got some choice in how they they do their work, and then they're more likely to contribute the stuff that you really need to be the same for everybody because it's one big enterprise and and uh so that that for me that's the sort of central thing of this enterprise architecture versus program and project managers the hmm. project managers want to do their stuff as quickly as possible and as cheaply as possible whereas presumably the program manager in together with the ea wants to have a sort of you know wants to have a consistent sort of picture across the organization and that tension of where to put that variability is the essence of that question that Paul raised, I think. I think um, coming back to being the town planner, I think the, the town planner EA can help with that, that thing. And it's a bit like, let me, I come back to the kind of city planning is when you design a city, there, there's no way as that, that planner that you, you can get into the detail in every part of it and, and B, fix it and all that kind of thing. But you would still say this area, I don't know, this area we designate as, I don't know, the, the entertainment area and therefore in that area, you can only build, I don't know, casinos and stuff like that, where another area might be more residential. Um, and I think creating those kind of zones within your enterprise where, you know, you might have more controls around, um, the residential area you might have slightly less controls around the kind of entertainment area um planning the enterprise in a kind of similar type way where you can say this is where there is flexibility this is where there isn't kind of helps um chris i didn't know whether i think uh, whether paul's still on and whether he wanted to maybe ask ask a question or, or ask whether that's satisfied his question Bear with me, let me just take a look and see if we still have Paul. And I am assuming he would like to talk as well. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can, Paul. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I cover enterprise architecture in a, in a utility. Um, and I've done a big carve out. And I'm just about to do a big carve in, or I should say a merger. So, um, what I, my experience... And that's why I brought up these two questions is that um, I see, I've seen a lot of silo thinking in the past. So basically the role I have to, to provide is the 10,000 meter view. Mm -hmm. uh, actually spot something that's going on in one area, which could really cause a big problem with somewhere else, only because teams don't talk to each other. So that's one thing I see from the EA. I suppose the, the conflict I've seen is, I've often find that, so I'll do an EA job on a project, and I do EA in terms of look at the overall strategy of how we can develop our infrastructure and technology. But where I often get tripped up is you have the project manager who's uh, very keen on making the name for themselves and saving some money or changing the scope of what was originally attended. <laughs> That's where I see the, uh, the conflict. So I'm not saying they're all bad, but you, you can soon get derailed. But um, I'd say the key thing is that um, the, for me, as, as an EA who does that town planner type of view, is I've got to have a good broad view of so what everything is going on. I don't need to know the detail, it's, the, it's, it's the, the broad view and how these things interact so that I can know where the pressure points are. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it really helps when you're doing a big exercise like doing a, a merger. Well, what can I just say? One of the sort of methods that we looked at in, in terms of uh, systems design methods is something called the soft systems methodology, uh, where the, the modeler actually looks at the analyst, looks at, actively looks at conflicts and actually seeks to find out where the conflict zones are. Because if these are hidden, they just come back and, and, and bite you, on the, you know, at the end and uh, they cause you problems. So you need to find out where the conflicts are and, and what, what are the bases, what are the roots of those conflicts to try to uh, not necessarily resolve them, but sometimes actually, if you do as much as modeling these conflicts explicitly for everyone to see, a lot of knowledge and a lot of 
resolution just just come for free almost yeah so I, that's I, one idea. I have to admit yes that's the thing i go looking for we uh, the things that conflict with our strategy um is what i go looking for to uh, to try to get those erased so we want to move to the cloud so you don't want people relying on things on a traditional platform so those are the kind of conflicts yeah. so you have a lot of people who are still server huggers who probably don't want to move their systems elsewhere so um yeah that's what I, i'd say and the negotiation which is a uh, you you have you know the, the thing is an ea you have to you have to point out to architects who work in a specific area or project managers is that um what they're working on has dependencies and relationships to other things and they have to consider those as well when they're making a change yeah trade-offs and negotiation which are sort of natural part of any design activity really you have to trade off and you have to weigh things against each other and you have to negotiate yeah. and actually silos can can give you a lot of uh, strategic flexibility i remember talking to the cfo of hansons the, the aggregates company in the days when hansons were a, a multi national multi-conglomerate and uh he 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 hated the idea that uh he should uh consolidate all the finance systems for instance onto one uh finance system because it would give the company less flexibility to trade uh various business units because they were always buying and selling companies and it uh, hit home to me last week my son works in a company where they've spent the last four years integrating a software company into a uh, a utility company and he's now been told he's got to unintegrate it all so the amount of money they spent pulling it all together they've now got to separate it all apart uh, and i think uh, sometimes as eas we over integrate things uh, and and often there's a lot of uh, strategic mm. flexibility in keeping things separate and maybe in the ghettos galal to lose your thing earlier so it's, it's an interesting uh, discussion often to, to be had as to how much integration you really want to create so long we've had another question that's come up from um ee moderator um which is really um focused around have you accounted for the combination of ea with physical town planning um open brackets done at harvard gsd from onset of the internet it, it feels to me that there's perhaps some more thinking that goes into this question. So um, if you'd be willing to um, add some more context, um, I'm just enabling um, you to be able to talk. So the moderator, are you with us? Hello. Can I, I'm sorry, is that a question for the... Uh... That's right, I think he just, uh, there we go, he moderated. Yeah, there seems to be a slight delay delay on unmuting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting I guess question. With, with the internet. Uh, it... I mean, I think, I suppose in terms of what we've spoken about today, um, I suppose we haven't really looked at kind of EA with physical. Well, we actually have independently, I suppose, made that connection between what EAs do and what do for physical town planning. Um, it suggests that there was something done at Harvard early days of, of internet related to that as well. I think I think I think E moderator is trying to talk, but uh, we keep interrupting. Let's give him a pause so he can talk. I'm typing it in. Uh, I'll just give you the reference. Well, the, the very purpose of, well, one of the main purpose of the internet was to overcome physical distance and physical separation. Okay, thanks for the reference, yeah. Okay, if you don't want to um, expand on that, it's interesting. I mean, one area I think we've touched on is, is, is and, and sort of 
is 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 actually the building the building itself going back to Galal's work you know we're, we're talking about the building and all the various services and everything the closest I've got is when I was in IBM there's a lot of really interesting work going into the uh, building management systems and how architects now will produce blueprints and designs which actually go right through the life cycle of the building and I think it's a beautiful analogy with EA when often a lot of the uh, uh, original architecture design documentation and reasons why you take decisions and the way the services are laid and everything has been lost yeah? and you actually have to go and remap it so this idea of end-to-end -end life cycle management of artifacts so that you actually can keep them and hold them and they become a useful part of the maintenance, which is what they do in building management systems, as opposed to just being design drawings, um, to me is, is an area that not really been explored too much um, and, and could be really interesting. Uh, and then obviously at a, at, a, at a sort of town planning level, as opposed to a building level, you know, that, that, that goes up another layer. So, I think it's an interesting area, but I've not seen much done on that. I don't know, Galal, if you have. I mean, it's going to partly answer, Lorne, because actually I did work at, uh, I've worked at construction firms and you, I, know, I know the building management systems you're talking about. And it's that great concept that right from the point that you're creating the architecture drawing, you can through that take that through into the manufacturing process, the building process, right through into the service management at the end. And then next time somebody comes along to make a change to that building, actually you've got the whole life of the, the building from the thing. And actually you can just replay it back to the beginning. Uh, and actually there's that kind of lovely, back to circular uh, economies in that for you, Lorne, making that connection. I think there are moves within, let's say technology towards that space, because you, we do hear a lot about kind of things like CNDBs, and I've seen more of a rise of um, architecture catalog tools, some kind of portfolio, but it's not kind of quite as seamless. I think perhaps that design piece in the middle um, isn't, isn't quite there yet. Um, and I think some of that is we don't actually have real any major standards that everybody adheres to. Um, so some people might create their diagrams and they use UML, somebody else might use some kind of free form hand thing, somebody might use Archie, but um, I think moving towards more standards will help us uh, move towards that kind of circle, um, but we're not, it, it's something to aspire to, I feel. <laughs> Glow, yeah, yeah. There's <laughs> always that difficulty of high level design to low level design it's never quite as sort of easy to uh, express is it in, in in terms of that stuff so no that makes sense to me yeah interesting I, I suppose one of the things i'd just like to contribute towards this is that having worked for global organizations and small organizations even down to startups is that sometimes the hygiene factors of just recording architectural decisions and rationale can really be helpful further down the line because there might be certain things that you think about up front that could be a good idea for good reason but you may find over time that people might ask various questions so just starting to record those ideas so there's that source of reference in knowledge management systems find that that can be really useful and there, there might be some things that um, you may get so far into the delivery where you might come up against a bit of an artisan developer who might have another idea of how to extract, transform, and load information, right? Um, that might challenge and create some healthy tension. So I think architecture decision logs are um, sometimes uh, quite a good hygiene factor to think about in practice. Absolutely. I agree. Okay. Is that all the questions, Chris? We got any more coming through? Let me just take a look. So thank you, E moderator. There's some additional reference um, information that's been uploaded. Um, there aren't any further questions that have come into the screen. Um, let me just check 
on the chat. Um, and I suppose, given where we are, I'm not sure whether or not there's any other attendees that might like to raise their hand just to maybe just ask a question and we can unmute you. Um, um, just take sort of final moments um, to get anyone else's views or thoughts around what's been discussed this evening. Okay. So it doesn't look like there's any further questions that are coming up. So um, I, I don't know, perhaps Lorne, as, as chair of Enterprise Architecture Specialist Group, could perhaps ask um, to hand over to yourself to give us any wisdom or closing words as we wrap up the evening. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Chris. Well, no, I, I've really enjoyed the scene. I hope everyone has too. It's, it's been an interesting uh, thing to step out of EA a bit and, and look at the sort of whole practice outside in from a town planning point of view. It certainly inspired me with Patrick Geddes. I was very inspired by, uh, you know, the other two speakers. So uh, hopefully it's given you some ideas and insights to go and work, work with um, in, in your own practice. So, so thank you all very much for coming and uh, looking forward to the next one, Ian. It's a great, it's a great series, this. <laughs> so yeah. well done. Thank you. And I think, um, as I say, combined with the previous two, the whole whole point of this series was to kind of, rather than being very general around EA, let's focus in on particular roles that we do and discuss those and, and expand on them. And say, for the next one, I'd like to sort of look at the artisan EA, who I'm kind of positioning as somebody who is much closer to the development teams, much closer to the implementers, um, and almost crafts the 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 architecture as it is being built, much like the um, artisans from two or three hundred years ago. Um, how how you know you build cathedrals and stuff like that? Is that actually you were there as the materials were being crafted because it was needed to to make that that building come alive? So um, I'm quite quite excited about that one personally. Um, but yeah, no, definitely, um, and, and thanks. Lorne for, for coming along talking and thanks Galau for for talking as well and, and your support Chris as well for the evening um, and I'd just like you know thank everybody who's joined this session um, it's been really good and, and hopefully you've taken something away from it um, and um, yeah look forward to seeing you at some of the, any of the future events uh, thank you